Hi everyone, welcome to the class on expectorants, antitussives, mucolytics, bronchoconstrictors and antihistamines. So welcome to I Love Pharmacology. So the specific learning objectives for today's session is at the end of this session, you should be able to define and differentiate between the terminologies expectorants, antitussives, mucolytics, bronchoconstrictors and antihistaminics. And also you should be able to explain the mechanism of action of each of them and you should be able to identify the clinical uses and you should be able to recognize the adverse drug effects and also some nursing implications which you need to keep in mind while educating the nursing students and nursing staff while handling the patients. So coming to the expectorants. So as you know that expectorants, expect means expel something what do you need to expel something from the body so the definition goes like this expectorants are the agents that enhance the expulsion of bronchial secretion so in common words you are expelling the sputum from the body so the examples are guaifenesin and ammonium chloride are the expectorants you're going to see as one of the ingredients in the cough syrups so the mechanism of action of expectorants is basically it will going to increase the bronchial secretion and reduce its viscosity. So in one single word if you need to remember the mechanism of action of expectorants. So expectorants will reduce the viscosity of the sputum thereby the viscosity reduces the uh, thickness of the sputum thereby once the uh, sputum becomes liquid it is more easier to expel from the body so that is the reason why you use expectorants uh, whenever there is a productive cough in other words productive cough means in simpler terms it is a wet cough so it these are used to relieve the patient from productive cough or wet cough so what are the adverse effects you can expect of so you can expect nausea and vomiting because of some of the uh, ingredients or excipients may uh, alter the taste sensation. So nursing implication, you need to ask them to monitor the effectiveness and educate on the hydration which is very very important in terms of expulsion of the sputum from the body when the patient uses the expectorants. Then next coming to the antitussives. So these are the agents which suppress the coughing. So you can remember that in antitussives you have got two S's means suppressive. So basically how do they suppress the coughing? So the examples are codeine and dextromethorphan. These are belongs to opiate group of drugs. And the mechanism of action of codeine in causing suppression of the cough is they acts on the cough center which is present in the medulla and they depresses the cough center. And where we can use such kind of drugs in practice. So these drugs can use in case of treating non-productive cough otherwise they are also called as dry cough so expectorant is for productive cough antitussive is for non-productive cough in other words expectorant is for wet cough and antitussive is for dry cough the major adverse effect you need to keep in mind while using a uh, codeine containing cough syrup is they can cause sedation and constipation especially the codeine so because of this sedation so what implication you should have clinical implication so you need to monitor for sedation and educate the patient regarding the potential for abuse you need to ask the patient not to use this medication frequently or repeatedly or more often because these can become addictive because of their sedative nature so because of this uh, ingredients even in cough syrup the concentration of codeine will be very very less and they make sure that the potential for abuse is reduced but even though there are conditions where the patients may get addicted to cough syrups since because it causes sedative effect coming to the mucolytic so the word itself says that muco means mucus and lytic means you are you are breaking down something what you are breaking you are breaking the mucus so these are the agents which break down the mucus which is present in the uh, bronchial secretions etc so the examples are the acetylcysteine bromoxine ambroxol acebrophilin 
So basic mechanism of action is these mucolytics will disrupt the structure of the mucus molecule thereby it breaks down the mucus into smaller molecules and they are useful in treatment of chronic bronchitis, cystic fibrosis, in chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases and in case of bronchial asthma. So adverse effects since it can break down the mucus into smaller particles, some of the particles may get aspirated while coughing out and they may cause bronchospasm sometimes and nausea. So next is the bronchoconstrictor. So why you need to remember about the bronchoconstrictor? So please remember that bronchoconstrictors are never used or not used nowadays because it causes bronchospasm. So why this slide is important means to understand the concept of antihistaminics you need to understand the bronchoconstrictor. So these bronchoconstrictors are the one which will going to narrow or constrict the bronchial the space or the radius of the bronchioles will be reduced so which are the more potent bronchoconstrictors so we have histamine and leukotrienes which are bronchoconstrictor basically they stimulate the smooth muscles in the bronchial smooth muscles and they cause cause contraction of those smooth muscles leading to contraction or reduction in the size of the bronchioles leading to difficulty in breathing or the patient will have a spasm or they will feel like something is happening in our lungs or the chest because of difficulty in breathing because of the narrowed bronchus. So histamine and leukotrienes uh, play a major role in development of the asthma as well as allergic reactions. So adverse effect is whenever you expose uh, the allergic patient to the pollen grinds they cause bronchospasm there can be increased bronchial secretion as well so you need to understand and you need to identify the mediators which can cause bronchial asthma and reducing those sensitization or coming in contact with such allergen should be avoided and it should be educated to the patient so coming to the antihistaminics, we have a very very important group of drugs and these are the agents which mainly blocks the histamine receptor basically and specifically it uh, uh, block the H1 receptors. Do not confuse, although it can also block the H2 receptor, predominantly it block H1 receptors whereas H2 receptors are predominantly present in the stomach. So H2 blockers are used to reduce the gastric acidity like example or anitidine etc. Here you are blocking H1 receptor which are involved in the allergic reactions. The examples are diphenhydramine and loratadine. Diphenhydramine is a first generation antihistaminics and loratadine is a second generation uh, antihistaminics. Let us see these differences in the next slide. So basically they are useful in the allergic uh, relief and also it can produce some sedation because of the anticholinergic effect which are mediated by the first generation antihistaminics. So because of first generation antihistaminics it can cause drowsiness because they can cause blood brain barrier and dryness of the mouth because of the anticholinergic effects. And that's what whenever we are using these medications or when you give these medications as a prescription so nurses has to mandatorily or educate the patient or uh, a person regarding the drowsiness or a sedative effect and such kinds or uh, such kind of person who are involving in uh, any alertness or which requires a constant attention or a lorry driver or any driver or who is working with the missionaries and all you need to make sure that they should not take this medication during their work time so best to take this medication is during bedtime so coming to the comparison of the first generation and second generation uh, antihistamines. So we have first generation and second generation. So example of first generation is diphenhydramine and chlorpheniramine and second generation is loratadine, citrizine, levocitrizine, fexofenidine, etc. So sedative effect is high in case of first generation but low or none in case of second generation. The reason being the first generation drugs can easily cross blood brain barrier where second generation will not cross the blood brain barrier and duration of action is short and multiple dose has to be given per day with respect to first generation but the gen but the longer duration of action is seen with the second generation where it requires once daily dosing and side effect profile when it comes to first generation side effects are more sedation is due to the crossing of the drug 
across the blood brain barrier and dryness of the mouth urinary retention and constipation is due to the anticholinergic effect and these side effects are very minimal or may not occur in case of the second generation antihistaminics and clinical uses of first generation antihistaminics are predominantly useful in treating the allergic reaction urticaria insomnia and motion sickness so motion sickness you use promethazine which is a first generation antihistaminics and we have a second generation uh, antihistaminics which are more useful in the treatment of allergic rhinitis a cold common cold or chronic urticaria so next comes the medication and dosage form and all these medications are available in the form of oral tablets oral solutions or syrups or sometimes inhalation solutions also and some of the drugs are available as extended release tablet granules and the chewable tablets more commonly we see see these uh, drugs in the dosage form of oral tablets as well as the syrups so this is a just example how the 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 the, the medications look like it, which is a bromoxane which is a elixir and this is a syrup of ambroxol this is the ambroxol so this we have a syrup drops capsules and the tablets here we have a uh, tablets as well as the levosolbutamol that is the beta 2 agonist terbitaline again a beta 2 agonist which will be combined with the syrups to make uh, sure that there is a some bronchodilatory effect which will give relief in case of the uh, productive cough so guanfenacin is used for productive cough even ambroxol which is a mucolytic agent so as we know that benadryl which is a more commonly and famous cough syrup you have benadryl dry syrup and uh, benadryl syrup for productive cough as well in productive cough we use ammonium chloride whereas in case of dry cough you use dextromethorphane which are mainly for a dry cough or non-productive cough so next we have a acibrofilin or along with acetylcysteine with cheese very very helpful in, in terms of clearing the sputum from the bronchus so these are some of the example and dosage form at what age dosage has to be given and what is the mg tablets it drops which strengths which are available in the market and these are the branded drugs which are available as well as the generic medication details and coming to the mcq to test the knowledge of ourselves and uh, uh, the this is a self test and we can evaluate ourselves so which of the following statement correctly differentiate the first generation antihistaminics from second generation antihistaminics so the options are first generation antihistaminics have a longer duration of action compared to second generation antihistaminics second generation antihistaminics are more likely to cause sedation compared to first generation antihistaminics first generation antihistaminics can cross blood brain barrier and cause sedation while second generation antihistaminics have minimal to no sedation second generation antihistaminics require multiple doses a day whereas first generation uh, typically requires once daily once daily dosing so if you go through these question please comment your answer in the chat box or a comment box below so next question is which of the following correctly pairs the drug class with its primary mechanism of action the option is expectorants which suppresses the cough reflex by acting on medulla antitussive break down the mucose to facilitate its removal from the respiratory tract mucolytic enhances the bronchial secretion and reduces the mucus viscosity antihistaminics block h1 receptor to elevate the allergic symptoms and bronchoconstrictor dilate the bronchial passage to ease the breathing in asthma patient so let us see who will get the correct answer and correct pair of terminologies and mechanism of action so this is the summary table for this class expectorants announces the expulsion of bronchial secretion the mechanism is it increases the bronchial secretion and the reduces the viscosity example guaifenesin ammonium chloride used to relieve the productive cough antitussive suppresses the cough reflex by acting on the medulla oblongata examples are codeine and dextromethorphane it is used for non productive cough that is a dry cough mucolytic helps in breakdown of the mucus they especially break down the structure of the mucus molecule and reduce the viscosity example or the uh, bromoxane acetylcysteine etc used for chronic bronchitis cystic fibrosis copd as well as asthma bronchoconstrictor not used nowadays just to understand the concept of bronchoconstriction which are the primary cause for bronchial asthma 
uh, and the COPD, the culprit are the histamine and leukotriene. So never administer histamine in any patient. Antihistamines, they block H1 receptor. We have H1 and H2. H1 is more sedative, H2 is less sedative and less sedative drug has to be given in patients who are handling any uh, work which requires more attention like lorry drivers, any machinery workers, etc. And these are used for allergic reactions, hay fever uh, and to produce sedation during the common cold to get a relief. Thank you. So this was all about the summary of expectorants, antidepressives, mucolytics and antihistamines. If you like this video or if you find this video useful, please do subscribe to our channel I Love Pharmacology for more updates on pharmacology further in coming days. Thank you.